About halfway down the long lake of Florida, there are several small towns quite different from the glamorous resort cities along the coast. They have their share of beautiful palms and trees draped in Spanish moss, but you won't find any Bermuda shorts or mambo bands. These quiet little towns are havens for the retired northerner who comes south seeking a place in the sun far from the hubbub of the big cities. Most of them have a tourist club, and this is the center of companionship and competition. But regardless of age, the spirit of competition can be found in almost everyone. The favorite game is shuffleboard, and every point is recorded carefully. Although the game is played for fun, winning is also important. The game is played with four wheel-like discs, and the tournament we're watching has one restriction. It's limited to contestants of 70 years or older. This particular town was founded in 1912 by a man from Ohio named George E. Sebring. Its elevation is 160 feet, population 8,000, just about average for this section of the state. But once a year, there is a drastic change. Sebring's quiet is suddenly shattered by a hectic hubbub of activity. Men converge on this small town from all parts of the globe. And for one day, change it into the mecca of the sports car world. These men are here for companionship and competition too. And the game they play requires four wheels, but much, much more. It requires great skill and stamina, not only from the men, but from the machines they bring with them. These men from Italy, Germany, France, England, North and South America are here not only to do battle against each other, but against a common foe. That relentless recorder of time, the clock. Once a year, speed and time conquer this small town and rule it with an iron hand. One day a year, Sebring, Florida ascends the heights of fame. This is the story of that day. The day is March the 22nd, 1958, and it begins very early for everyone. The crews begin final preparations as soon as it is light. These sleeping beauties are the factory Porsches from Stuttgart. This rudely awakened Ferrari is a Testa Rosa, wearing the racing colors of Cuba. Slowly, the pits begin to buzz with activity that will not subside until long after sundown tonight. The pits are stocked with mechanical plasma that will keep the cars going during the battle. The people who have come from everywhere to watch the game of speed are lined up for miles down the highway. The racing machines that were garaged in town have to be escorted to the course. This is the Lotus team from England arriving. And here is Scuderia Ferrari from Modena, Italy, three of the new 250 TRs. One of the first things to be done is fuel the cars. The rules specify that straight gasoline must be used and a portable service station has been set up to officially fill the dry tanks. Hundreds of five gallon cans will be used in the pits after the race begins to refuel the thirsty beasts that will be consuming a gallon every three or four minutes. For most of the crews, a quick cup of coffee is breakfast. The beautiful new Abarth Fiats are entered in Class H. The bodies were built by Zagato. Just one year ago, this name appeared on a brutish four and a half liter V8, and with Fangio and Barra behind it, won the race. Now there are only two Maseratis here, both private American entries. 300S, and this two-liter owned and driven by Jim Kimberly. Isn't this Oscar beautiful? Making his first appearance in this country, the very streamlined Lister Jaguar brings with it a fantastic record of wins on the continent. Combine a Jag engine and an extra light body and chassis, you have a very exciting sports car. Also appearing in the colonies for the first time, perhaps the most famous non-factory team in the world, the Ecuria Cos. The dark green D-Jags have won the 24-hour at Le Mans the last two years and were the only challengers to our Indianapolis cars at Monza. 
This is the Le Mans winner, Ron Flockhart, worrying over last minute details with his mechanic. He will co-drive with an American, Maston Gregory. This year there's been a big switch to the Grand Touring class. All the Triumphs and Austin Healy's are running tops this year. The B12 and the new 250 TRs is basically the same as the 38 Ferrari ran last year, but it has been reduced to three liters to comply with this year's formula. It certainly wasn't carbureted with fuel economy in mind. The new Elva Mark III. This conversation runs something like this. The girl is telling Jean Barra how much she admires him, and Harry Shell is telling her that if she will kiss him, he will kiss Barra far. All oh, those Frenchmen. Some drivers prepare for the race. A very handsome creation is the Ferrari 250 Grand Touring. There are two of these coupes entered by the North American Racing Team. They are also powered by the 3-liter V12, but with a trifle less carburation. The DBR1s of the English Aston Martin Team have 3-liter, 6-cylinder dual-cam engines under the bonnet. They also have a Mark III entered in the Grand Touring. As starting time draws near, we find Sterling Moss practicing the Le Mans start. prove much on that. The cars are now being placed in position on the starting grid. And now, 65 drivers listen to the countdown until it's 10 a.m. and the 12-hour Grand Prix of Endurance has begun. Most of the cars are closely grouped during the first lap. By the time the leaders reach the back straight, they have begun to pull away from the field. The first man by the pit is Moss, followed by Hawthorne, Salvadori, Hill, and Scott Brown. Next, Jean de Bien, Von Neumann, Crawford, and Fitch. Then, the Ecuri across, Wuschel sandwiched in between, and Barra pursuing the three of them, and in turn being pursued by 52 other drivers. Moss is starting to lap some of the field. And his teammate, Salvadori, has passed Hawthorne, making it 1-2 for Aston Martin. Hill remains fourth. But Scott Brown, who was fifth, lost a valve and was rammed by Jean de Bien, putting the Lister out and the Ferrari in the pits. Soon, several individual battles develop. Salvadori and Hawthorne continue to have their feud with Hill keeping them in sight. And the Lotus are running as if they were attached. Salvadori just edges by Hawthorne. And Bear and Fitch are taking turns passing each other. The Ecuria cost cars are right together. Salvador's Aston, Hawthorne's Ferrari. Barra's 1600 Porsche, Fitch's 250 Testa Rosa. Salverson, D, followed by Flockhart. Whoops, Flockhart lost his D-type, and that ends that duel, at least for now. Hawthorne has regained second place from Salvadori. And Fitch is closing on Barra. The 
powerful Ferrari passes the little Porsche on the straights, but Barra catches up in the corners. We've just learned that Crawford's Lister Jag is also out with mechanical trouble. These two are still at it, but Hill is gaining on them. Moss is doing a fantastic job and has already lapped more than half of the 65 cars. This time Salvador tries the inside and they enter the pit straight wheel to wheel. Hawthorne's co-driver Count Wolfgang von Trips tries not to worry about the struggle his teammate is having. But suddenly, the duel is over. Salvadori has been called into the pits for refueling, tires, and relief by his co-driver, Carol Shelby. Roy has a few words with Tony Brooks, who is waiting to relieve Moss. Team manager Reg Parnell instructs the crew with the aid of a portable speaker. And then Shelby is ready to go, but the pit steward is having trouble sealing the tank. Salvadori, a very tired Englishman. Next, the leading car pits. And just as Moss slides to a stop, the left rear tire goes flat. With the already low body now even lower, they have to resort to jacking up the side of the car. You've heard the expression, he drove the wheels off the car. Well, you'll never see a better example than this. The other tire is also down in the corner. But now, with a little more tread on the rear, Brooks is ready. With the Assens in the pits, the lead has now gone to Scuderia Ferrari, with Hawthorne first. Now Hill makes his bid for the lead. That's Chamberlain and a Team Lotus. Moss put in a remarkable two hours behind the wheel of number 24. He lapped consistently below last year's record and on the 31st lap turned in an amazing time of 3 minutes 20.3 seconds. When he pitted he had lapped all but three cars. This is one of them, Phil Hill now in first. As the car stops the Ferrari technical manager Amarati measures the tire's tread depth, while a mechanic awaits his decision, and Hill goes over the wall. This outstanding American driver fought hard for the lead, and now he sweats out every agonizing second the car is in the pits. After a word with his co-driver, his nerves can stand no more, and he has to turn away. Now a very able Englishman will take over the red machine, bearing the Italian mark. Peter Collins is on his way, while teammate Hill utters a few choice words about the pit stop. After the pit stops, there have been several position changes. This is how they are running at the end of 3 hours and 25 minutes. Number 24 leads, followed by 14, 25, and 15. That's Brooks, Collins, Shelby, and Von Tricks, all on the 51st lap. Next, one lap behind, number 42, 17, 41, 16, 19, and 9. Bart, Ginther, Shell, Musso, Hugus, and Gregory. Number 8, Jag, is out. Suddenly, Shelby stalls just beyond the pits and must push the car back. With a little help from another one of the team drivers, he makes his way back to the pits. Apparently it's something serious and requires a look at the transmission or differential. This is a tough break, especially for the Texan. Sebring seems to be almost a jinx for Shelby. Last year he was disqualified while running in good position. The year before it was mechanical trouble. And now this. His tremendous disappointment is obvious.
Moss is upstairs calling down Brooks's progress at number 24 to manager Parnell, who has taken over personally on number 25. Although Brooks is doing a fine job, it's quite evident that Moss would much prefer to be out there grinding down another set of tires than staying here watching the second stick run. With the work progressing, Shelby takes heart and puts his helmet back on. But he's not the only one having trouble. These were both a case of a front wheel suddenly separating itself from the car. The only Morgan in the race just flipped and is out. The driver is uninjured though. Then someone starts a really good brush fire. But the smoke and flames prove no detriment to the drivers. They continue to flash by with hardly a glance. Given up on number 25, the U-joint shaft just couldn't be repaired. Here's Barth bringing in the 1600. After 83 laps, the streamlined little beauty is in fifth position. Again, we see the result of a lead foot and a tough course. This one's even worse. One more lap might have been too much which seems to be what Barris thinking. They removed the protective covering from the lights now in case the car doesn't pit again before sundown. Boy, it's hard work wearing down those tires. But Barris seems more than willing to take his turn at it. Last year's co-winner is ready. After some difficulty, rejoins the battle. And Moss has relieved Brooks, who lost the lead when he pitted. Sterling sets out to regain the lead. But by the time he reaches the S's, he's running Sands Bonnet. The hood flew off on the long straight beyond the pits. The car killing courses claim some more victims. Both Ecuria cost D types are out now, plus the Cunningham D, and that's all for Jaguar. The course is also claiming some of the spectators. Up since before dawn, they're beginning to drop like flies. Let's go back up in the chopper and take another look at the murderous miles of macadam and cement that formed the torture tour known as Sebring. This is a team manager's nightmare. Not only does he have to gear the car high enough for straightaway speeds of 160 miles an hour, but low enough to accelerate out of 15 mile an hour corners. Another problem is how to make the brakes last when somebody keeps putting 90 degree corners at the end of 5,000 foot straights. And still another is how to make the tires last when taking these bins in an almost flat-out drift. Yes, Sebring deserves its reputation as the world's toughest course. In fact, I think maybe we'd better get back on the ground before we decide it's impossible for a car to race around this circuit for 12 hours. If we need further proof, here it is. Barra had to bring the 1600 into the pits. And we have another very disappointed driver on our hands. It's a long way from France. Apparently it's the rear end. Prepare yourself for another shock. Moss is out with differential trouble too. But there's one pit where everything is not only going smoothly, but very smoothly. Team manager Tavoni calmly keeps his charts and waits for Scuderia Ferrari with help from Von Trips and Collins. And the charts show a very remarkable thing. The blood-red machines from Odenna are now first with Hale and number 14, 
second with Hawthorne, number 15. And third with Jean de Bien at 16. Just to keep it all in the family, Ferrari is also fourth with Von Neumann in 17. There are 20 cars out at this hour, but only two of them are Ferraris, Fitch and Flynn. This happy situation brings with it a little optimistic horseplay from Collins as he tries to thumb a ride from Hill, whose lap time of 3 minutes 30 seconds is terrific for this stage of the race. This gentleman has a two-fold reputation, his name, Ruberosa. The Ferrari pits are quiet for the moment, but they have called the cars in for fuel. A very handsome Roman, Luigi Musso, Italy's top driver. He's waiting to relieve Jean de Bien at the wheel of 16. I'm not sure if Musso can understand his teammate from Belgium, but our liberal translation might be, when you push the brake pedal, man, nothing. Apparently Musso gets the message, and now he counts the seconds. Ron Newman is in with the fourth place car, and he certainly shows the strain of battle. Ginther leaps into the car and sets out in pursuit of the leaders. Hawthorne heads for the pits. And here he is now. Bow tie neatly in place. Collins continues to lead by a lap. And the little Oscar has surprised everyone by leading the index, usually dominated by Porsche. As the lights come on, here are the standings at 6 o'clock. The first four are Ferraris, followed by a Porsche, two Lotus, a Ferrari Grand Touring, a Testa Rosa, and the Oscar. Ferrari pit is a scene of quiet confidence. The only movement is Tavoni's watch and pencil as he checks off the laps. For Collins, 140 of them. Ruberosa comes in for fuel and relief. overall and second in his class. The lovely girl is Mrs. Ruberosa. Mike Hawthorne checks Tavoni's charge to see how Vaughn Tripps is doing. And Hill worries about Collins. But they're out on the course doing just fine. Except there's not a sign of a break left on any of the Scuderia cars and it's pump and pray on every corner. Spectators are busy moving around, trying to find a better vantage point. And the drivers are busy moving around, trying to find the course. It's really black out there now. Lights on the entire circuit are the small bulbs strung along the pits. And even here, the pit signals have to be illuminated to be seen. A 
special signal goes out to the leaders. Slow down, save the machines. But it came too late to save the Hawthorne von Tripp's car. Number 15 is out, but Ferrari is still one, two, three. The index leaders are Oscar, Porsche, Lotus, and Ferrari. They also lead in their individual class. About half of the cars that start are out of the race. And here's another. Gitter is in the pits with number 17 and is informed that the pinion gear is completely shot. What a blow. Third place cinched. 900 twisting terrible miles. Ten and a half hours. But the race is for 12. Still another car breaks under the terrific strain. Now it's just Hill and John to be in for Ferrari and Collins desperately signals him to slow down. The last hour is a cautious one, with flashing lights and crossed fingers. Then it's 10 p.m. and it's over. They try to warn the crowd that there aren't any brakes. Hill had pitted at the last moment and turned the wheel over to Collins. And together they received the wreaths of victory. In his extreme joy, Collins kisses him. And although a little shocked, Phil says it's okay. Now they get the trophy. No, I guess they don't get the trophy. Oh, I see. They forgot to kiss the Grand Prix Queen. And more kissing. The woman pushed through the crowd shouting, that's my husband. But Hill isn't married. So we have a mystery one. Squash like sardines, the best fight for shots of all this amorous going on. And still more kissing, this time by a woman claiming Collins is her husband. And she's right, it is Mrs. Collins. Now they receive the huge American Oil Company trophy, and it's richly deserved. These two combine to drive their Ferrari 200 laps. The last 50 without the aid of brakes. That's 1,040 miles, a new Sebring record. They beat 64 of their cars, and they beat the top drivers. But most important, they beat the clock. <laughs>